Democratic Congressman Jonah Goose of Colorado served as a House impeachment manager for Donald Trump's second impeachment over his incitement of the January 6th insurrection. He joins me now. Congressman, good to see you in person. Good to see you, Ali. Thanks for having me on. You're one of the very few people in this country who've been through this process, albeit it was earlier. You had less information. You had to move very fast because that impeachment took place uh, very soon after uh, after the insurrection. What's your sense of what's going on with Jack Smith, the target letter, the things that we hear Donald Trump may be charged with? Are you satisfied that those are the right things, first of all? Well, I would say first, clearly a series of significant developments, and in particular, the reporting regarding the target letter, Mr. Trump's disclosure of that letter. Of course, we don't necessarily know what statutes were invoked right. in the letter, and it isn't necessarily the case that to the extent the special counsel or the grand jury are pursuing uh, various criminal charges against the former president, that they would be limited to those statutes right. or involve those statutes at all. So it's, it would be premature for me to opine necessarily on the nature of the indictment. What I will say is... There is no dispute, as you know, thinking back and reflecting on the impeachment trial a year and a half ago, that the president, as Mitch McConnell readily conceded, mm -hmm. was morally and practically responsible for ultimately provoking the events of that fateful day on January 6th. And we believed he was ultimately guilty of constitutional crimes, ultimately the the, uh, the constitutional crime for which he was impeached. A trial was held in the Senate, the most bipartisan vote for conviction in the history of presidential impeachments, notwithstanding uh, that it didn't meet the, the constitutional two-thirds standard for a vote. So, look, at the end of the day, as Mitch McConnell, again, at the risk of quoting him too often, but, you know, he has and said this previously, that no former president is immune to civil liability or criminal liability. At the end of the day, the special counsel, the Department of Justice are going to make the judgments that they believe uh, are consistent with the law and mm -hmm. the facts. And, uh, you know, I am comfortable with whatever decisions the special counsel and, and a grand jury may or may not reach. What's your sense of the, the decision about making certain charges uh, and how that differs between what you did in the impeachment and what Jack Smith has to do? Jack Smith's got a clock. Uh, he's got a president who is recalcitrant, a, a, well, a target who is recalcitrant. He doesn't want to appear because he's too busy running for office. Clearly, if he got his way with Aileen Cannon and this uh, Mar-a-Lago trial were delayed until after the election and he were to win as president, we all know how that'll turn out. He's going to say, you can't, you can't prosecute me. So, so Jack Smith wants to be able to bring charges that he can get in front of a jury and get done with, hopefully, before 2025. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, and again, it's an important distinction that you raised at the outset, the special counsel has, I suspect, far more evidence right. available to him and to the grand jury than we had when we were prosecuting uh, the impeachment a year and a half ago. Of course, that was the case with respect to the select committee on January 6th as well. Right. Much of the evidence that they were able to glean for the American people at a granular level in terms of the events of January 6th and the president's misconduct with respect to provoking the events of that day, we didn't have access to. Uh, again, I trust the special counsel to faithfully execute the duties of his office, and we're going to have to wait and see what potential charges may or may not arise out of that proceeding. But I, we have an impartial and independent justice system for a reason, and what every one of your viewers should certainly be uh, disheartened by, uh, and I think concerned about, are the series of ominous videos yeah. that you just played. Yeah. Because they are consistent with the way in which the president conducted himself when he was in office, this constant undermining and attack of the rule of law, which, as you know, is sacrosanct. Well, it seems to States. be it seems to be bleeding into threat now. Um, the stuff that he said about Aileen Cannon was really a veiled idea that she's a patriot. We need more judges who do the right thing. He's not said that about most judges in cases that are in which he's being uh, prosecuted or sued. Uh, this idea about when we come in, we're going to it used to be drain the swamp. It's much more aggressive now. Now he calls himself uh, your retribution. There's a there's sort of an ugliness around this that we see a little bit of in the House now with the weaponization committee. There's this idea that the power of the government could be brought to bear against those who are his opponents or critics. Yeah, and look, that is a direct byproduct of the stranglehold that former President Trump continues to have on the Republican Party writ large. Uh, his shadow looms large within the House Republican caucus. The extremists have unfortunately uh, taken power. Yeah. And you see this every week with these 
incoherent hearings uh, that they have continued to, uh, to conduct at the taxpayer's expense. You see it in the policies that they are pursuing to restrict freedoms, undermine voting rights, and of course, uh, to say nothing of their work to try to undermine the economic progress that our country has made in the last few years under President Biden and Congressional Democrats' leadership. So, yes, it's deeply concerning, and uh, ominous is probably the best word that I could use to describe. But, but you can, those if you can get inside Donald Trump's head, which we, we can't, but <laughs> but it's it's different, right? We understand why he does this, and, and people like Ruth ben Giat write books about why dictators become dictators and autocrats become autocrats. What's in it for your colleagues in the House, the average House Republican? Why do this? There are exit ramps and off ramps so often with Donald Trump, the place where you can say this is enough, or even like some have said, let's wait to see what the outcome of this trial will be. But no, everybody jumps both feet in behind Donald Trump and, and some of this crazy stuff. Yeah, look, I think that question bedevils us all in the House. Yeah. And it's a question that many of us ask ourselves often, certainly a question that we asked ourselves during the course of the impeachment trial, when, as you know, only seven Republican senators were willing to choose country over party and do the right thing. Uh, and I, I, I don't have a good answer for yeah. you. That's a question that I think we have to pose to Republican members of Congress. And by the way, other Republicans of good faith who yes. had to tell them to take back their party yeah. uh, and, you know, to, to, to sort of prevent it from descending into the abyss, as, as unfortunately it has been uh, on this, you know, sort of course for quite some time now. What do you know now that you didn't know when you were an impeachment manager? Uh, around January 6th, because since then there's been the House January 6th committee, and then there have been these investigations and the indictment in Mar-a-Lago. Is there anything that was really key that you didn't know, or do you feel like you had most of the story back then? No, I mean, we had a lot of the story, but of course, as, again, as you referenced, the impeachment trial happened uh, within six weeks yeah. of January 6th. You know, there is a lot that we've learned about the president's conduct during that day that we didn't necessarily know during the course of the trial. Uh, just some of the disclosures, from example, uh, Ms. Cassidy Hutchinson, who testified in front of the Select Committee on January 6th, very powerful and compelling testimony. And, you know, learning some of the facts that she was able to share with the American public, I think was jarring for many of us, not just impeachment managers, but I think for many sure. members of Congress, by the way, who all experienced January 6th. I was in the House, on the House floor uh, that fateful day. And so, yeah, I, I, I couldn't be more proud of the work that the January 6th Select Committee did in terms of trying to, to get a better grasp mm -hmm. of a lot of the facts that up till that point had not necessarily been divulged, not even to the members of public, but yeah. to members of Congress. Thank you.